Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Barron Emerging Markets Fund, International Growth Fund, and New Asia Fund webinar with portfolio managers Michael Cass, Anuj Agarwal, and the team. My name is Roger Mack. I'm a director on the National Accounts Team at Barron. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the discussion box on your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up and address them at the end of our discussion. Um, thanks, Michael and Anuj, for uh, joining us on this call. Uh, before we move into Q&A, can you recap the fund's performance for the fourth quarter and the full year of 2022? Uh, sure, thanks, Roger. Um, so for the fourth quarter, the uh, Barron Emerging Market Fund uh, was up 8.58% modestly underperforming the MSCI EM index, which was up 9.7, and the IMI growth index up uh, about 9.3%. Uh, the international growth uh, strategy was up four, Barron International Growth was up 14.85%, modestly outperforming the, uh, the, the benchmark Acqui XUSA index, which was up 1428 and more notably, it outperformed the uh, IMI Growth uh, International Index, which was up 12.73. I think during that, uh, the core of the key catalysts in our view were passing through what we call peak hawkishness, which was you know, a positive catalyst. And then in addition, you know, during the quarter, China's major policy pivot, which led to you know, strong, bo both of those you know, factors really drove strong global and particularly international equity performance during the quarter. Uh, for the full year, while well, the fourth quarter was a recovery quarter, the full year was not uh, as exciting. Barron uh, Emerging Market Fund was down 25.8%, uh, underperforming the MSCI EM index, which was down a little over 20%. Uh, but the Emerging Market Strategy uh, much more modestly underperformed the all-cap growth proxy, uh, which was down 23.9%. On the international growth side, Barron International Growth Fund was down 27.3% underperforming the Acqui XUSA index down 16%. Uh, again, uh, our growth oriented strategy, you know, more modestly underperforming the international all cap growth proxy, which was down 23.5%. For the full year, you know, the key drivers we would say were the kind of unexpected scope of the global rise in inflation, which was compounded by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, all to provoke a big increase in interest rate, uh, interest rate really driving an interest rate hiking cycle well above expectations. Uh, and that disproportionately weighed on growth equities worldwide. Um, in addition, you know, we would just comment that China's zero COVID adherence and geopolitical uncertainties, you know, in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine also weighed broadly on equities during the year. Uh, so that's our recap of the quarter and the year. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael, in your third quarter letter, and again at the Barron Conference in early November, you discuss the importance of the notion of peak central bank hawkishness, uh, which in your view would serve as a catalyst for improving international EM and perhaps uh, growth equity relative performance. Is that what we are now seeing? And would you recommend increasing EM international allocations at these levels? Sure. Uh, you know, definitely, you know, we did suggest some months ago that that Fed hawkishness in particular had reached a zone of practical constraint. You know, I'd say near the end of the third quarter, we, we, we called that out. Um, you know, and our view was that combined with a likely moderation in, in inflation readings that, you know, we would expect a shift in, in tone signal with, by the Fed, which would signal a pause in rate hikes. And, you know, we're kind of that's where we are now. Uh, back then, a few months ago, we had said that we'd be looking for a peak in the U.S. dollar. You know, the dollar was still, you know, in, in it, you know, kind of right near the peak of its uh, really parabolic rise during last year. And we'd be looking for a peak in the dollar, sovereign bond yields, and real interest rates, you know, as evidence to serve as the market signals that we were passing through peak hawkishness. And that would imply a near-term peak in equity risk premium and suggest a new regime which would favor EM and international equities on a, on a relative basis. So I would say yes, you know, the you know, confirmation, fourth quarter is confirmed that, that to us, this is exactly what we've been seeing. We're now pretty confident that we've entered a sustainable period of international and EM equity relative outperformance. 
And uh, I would say the subsequent pivot in, in China on zero COVID and, and large scale easing measures only add fuel to that fire. Indeed, from November 1st through year end last year, EM equities outperformed the S&P by about 1300 basis points. A lot of that being recovery of, of, of prior underperformance, of course. Uh, and then international equities also outperformed the S&P during that period by 1100 basis points. And this has really continued uh, and sustained into early this year where EM has now outperformed the S&P by about 2,000 basis points from that, say, say since uh, Halloween, uh, and international 1,600 basis points. So we are definitely encouraged. Uh, we felt we're pretty on target with uh, in those third quarter communications. Uh, we, however, we, we still think we're in the very early innings. Uh, first, we think the dollar is completing or has completed a 14-year bull market, an extended bull market. Uh, we think we're very early in the beginning of a new cyclical bear market in the dollar and that this would be a key catalyst for reversal of leadership away from U.S. assets. That's just one catalyst. Uh, second, you know, even after the recent uptick, EM and international equities are at 30-year relative valuation lows. And, and I would say that's applied against weak earnings. In the case of China, COVID impaired earnings. Uh, and we would suggest a mean reversion on relative valuation alone would suggest material upside. But we think that the more you know, unexpected catalyst is going to be an improvement in real earnings expectations that will be driven by this you know, early stage. And we think we'll be developing through this next you know, five, 10 years, a global capital investment cycle. That capital investment cycle is, is required under this, in this new area, era of reduced globalization. And so we expect EM International will be the biggest beneficiaries of the new priorities around global security and supply chain diversification. Uh, and we've said, you know, in previous communications, you know, this is really, it's a transfer of, of wealth and pricing power and earnings power from U.S. and developed world consumers to the owners of real assets and, 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 and those entities that hold industrial pricing power. And, and in addition, you know, to the beneficiaries of interest rate normalization, which is another major kind of uh, vector change that we saw play out last year. Um, so it's just the fact that EM and international economies and markets are more geared to the sea change as, as greater beneficiaries of the sea change. So no, we do not think it's too late at all. We think we're in the very early innings and that investors should be taking a contrarian view uh, and consider reweighting uh, on a multi-year basis. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to themes, uh, countries and, and recent performance. India remains a, a large afterweight, overweight, excuse me. But after a couple of years of leadership, it began to underperform last qu quarter. What, what triggered this? And do you still retain your conviction here as well? What are some of your best ideas in India? Anuj? Sure. Yeah, I think we should, yeah, sure. this is Anuj's yeah. uh, specialty here. So let's yeah. turn it over. Yeah, th thanks, Roger. Uh, yes, uh, our investments uh, in India did underperform uh, during the quarter, but this really didn't come as a surprise to us uh, as we did expect a retracement of prior period gains. And as a reminder, uh, India was our largest contributor during the third quarter and also held up relatively well all through 2022. But just to provide a little bit more granularity, uh, we did see a slowdown in consumer activity in India during the fourth quarter, which did impact near-term near -term earnings growth for many of our businesses. And I would say that was one of the key contributors for the relative underperformance. That said, uh, to put things into a bit of perspective, <clears throat> and this may actually come as a surprise to many, but India has been one of the best performing markets in the world over the past one and three years, even trumping the returns for the S&P 500 in US dollars over that period. Uh, so we do retain uh, you know, high conviction uh, in India and a large overweight uh, for a few reasons, but most importantly, due to the productivity enhancing economic reforms that have been implemented by the Modi administration over the past few years, that is really supporting higher sustainable GDP growth going forward, while also accelerating the formalization and digitization of the economy. And thanks to reforms such as uh, the GST, which is the goods and services tax, the PLI scheme, uh, which really incentivizes global corporates and supply chains to set up shop in India, uh, the Bankruptcy and Real Estate Act, 
as well as the simplification of various land and labor laws, uh, we believe India is entering a virtuous investment cycle you know, that will last for the next several years uh, and positioning India uh, to become the fastest growing large economy in the world this decade. And we believe GDP growth can sustain anywhere between five to 7% for the next five to 10 years. Uh, another exciting opportunity for us is the digitization uh, thematic that's playing out in India with over 650 million Indians now having access to a smartphone and high-speed mobile broadband data, which is really causing an inflection in the country's digital ecosystem, uh, which in our view is probably 10 to 15 years behind that of China. So we're seeing a lot of exciting bottoms-up opportunities in e-commerce, fintech, food tech, ed tech, among other digital uh, platforms and services. And we've mentioned this, and just to summarize as well, we've mentioned this previously, uh, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint as well, you know, I, I, in our view, it's advantage India, given uh, the country has increasingly pivoted uh, towards the US and broadly the West, uh, both from a military as well as an economic standpoint, uh, you know, over the past several years, um, and also really acts as a strategic counterweight to a rising China uh, in Asia. So, so this is, uh, you know, why we like India from a top-down economic reforms agenda perspective. Uh, let's <clears throat> discuss, uh, you know, from a bottoms-up view, some of the ideas that we, we like. So I would like to highlight our investment in SBI Life as one of our higher conviction uh, investments. Uh, SBI forms, uh, SBI Life forms part of our India financialization of household savings thematic. And our core premise here is really a structural shift in household savings from gold and real estate that today accounts for the majority of savings towards more financial products, uh, you know, such as equities, as well as life insurance uh, uh, savings schemes. Uh, and we've owned SPI Life since the IPO, so now over five years ago, and continue to remain excited about future growth opportunities over the next five years. So SPI Life is the largest private sector life insurer in India with about 15% plus market share. And insurance penetration uh, in the country is still in its very early growth phase with less than 10 million lives insured today out of population of 1.4 billion. So in our view, the industry will continue to sustain uh, mid-teens mid -teams premium growth, and SBI Life is positioned uh, to grow even faster, about 18 to 20% in our view, uh, given the industry is consolidating in the, in the hands of larger, well-managed private sector players. And SBI uh, has a unique competitive advantage in its ability to leverage over 27,000 branch, uh, bank branches of its parent entity, the State Bank of India, uh, you know, which really uh, puts uh, SBI in a high growth trajectory given the penetration levels for the SBI customer base is in low single digits today. So just to summarize, uh, you know, we're really excited about SBI Life. Uh, we believe the stock can double over the next four to five years, uh, you know, driven by that 18 to 20% premium growth along with an improving margin trajectory due to a favorable product mix shift. So that's, that's our overview on India, our excitement for, uh, you know, for India from a long-term perspective and some of the key bottoms up opportunities that we're seeing. So back to you, Roger. Terrific, thanks Anush. Um, China's recent outperformance seems to have surprised most investors. Um, we know you've remained broadly constructive through all of vol the volatility in the past year. Can you elaborate on some key developments leading the, to the recent outperformance and how you see the path forward from here? Uh, sure, I'll take this one, Roger. Um, you know, we definitely have commented extensively over the past year uh, that we felt China's zero COVID measures were ultimately untenable given the obvious economic and political constraints and, and that notwithstanding, you know, their disappointing adherence to you know, right in advance of the recent party Congress back October, November, uh, where, you know, markets, you know, got increasingly, uh, uh, you know, pessimistic on China, given their adherence to zero COVID 
that we, you know, maintained that we expected a reopening would eventually materialize. And, you know, investors were definitely, I would say, shocked. And even we were surprised at the speed and, and the scope just, you know, just immediately post the Congress by, you know, maybe two, three weeks after the new leadership that, that took shape, you know, they both abruptly dismantled the zero COVID policies and went all in on liquidity and, and stimulus measures that were aimed at stabilizing the property and financial sectors and at driving a recovery in consumption. So in our view, you know, we think now we're set up in China that we're going to likely see an overshoot in 2023, uh, that the new, you know, the new leadership just must achieve success. They must demonstrate that uh, that the new policies uh, will will be successful, will drive uh, stabilization in the property sector and a big consumption recovery. Uh, so to us, an upside surprise in consumption, recovery in the property sector, uh, you know, much, much like what we saw in the US in the post-COVID reopening period in, in late 2020 and through 2021, we believe that it's more likely than not that we'll see material upside in earnings expectations across China, uh, across China. And that um, particularly, I'd say, in the areas most leveraged to reopening and that stimulus, I'd say definitely China still has relatively low expectations or investors have low expectations with regard to China. Uh, I'd say investors still have an underweight positioning bias and a, we believe there's a high likelihood of positive earnings recovery and surprise. So that's a pretty good, you know, setup. We, and while, you know, I would say looking at the U.S. on a relative basis, you almost have the opposite. We think the U.S. is probably entering a period of acute earnings vulnerability due to the tightening that's that's already in the pipeline. And you combine with the likelihood that that the Fed will need to remain on hold for longer than in previous cycles in order to restore their inflation fighting credibility. So, you know, I think to us. We think it's early. Uh, it's not too late to reposition in China. We think that you know it's likely to overshoot to the upside as you move through this this next year. But you know, I think for specifics, it's probably a good opportunity. You know, for me to turn it over to Eric, who covers our you know leads our consumer research, and I think he could expand a bit on our China consumer positioning and maybe some specific names. Thanks, Michael. Um, I want to highlight several stocks either in China or with significant exposure to China in which we initiated positions for the first time during COVID specifically from 2020 to 2022, when we knew their near-term results would be significantly impaired. In all cases, these are high quality businesses whose valuations were compressed due to COVID disruptions, but whose balance sheets would allow them to withstand a lengthy shock and who we thought were likely to take market share and emerge in an even stronger position on the other side. We wanted to own these businesses anyway and essentially took advantage of the valuation dislocation. And now we expect them to be material beneficiaries of China's reopening over the next 12 months. Um, these are Galaxy Entertainment, Pernod Ricard, Budweiser APAC, Richemont, and Yum China. And I'll give a brief summary of each because I think these are good examples of, of what we do and how we invest. So first, Galaxy Entertainment. This is one of six concessionaires with a license to operate integrated gaming resorts in Macau. It has a net cash balance sheet, the best existing assets in Macau, and the largest growth pipeline of any of its five peers in that market. So we think this is the best business with the best growth pipeline in global casino gaming. We expect uh, to be a big beneficiary of Chinese revenge spending on both gaming and tourism over the next 12 months. Pernod Ricard is one of the largest listed spirits companies in the world, headquartered in France. Relative to its peers, it's overweighted to Asia and to the travel-dependent duty-free channel there specifically. It also has nearly half of the entire cognac profit pool in China, which is the most important Western-style spirit in that market, and a highly concentrated and supply-constrained category globally. So we think it'll generate above-peer growth in 2023 and 2024. Budweiser APAC is Anheuser-Busch's listed subsidiary in China. It is absolutely dominant in premium and super premium beer there. So it generates something like half of all beer industry profits in China on just 13% of volume. That's 50% of profits on 13% of volume. Premium and super premium are significantly underpenetrated in China relative to other Asian markets and are thus likely to be structural growers over the next decade. So Bud APAC is squarely positioned to be the single largest beneficiary of that secular growth. It's worth noting that premium and super premium beer are five to 10 times more profitable than mainstream beer. So as that shift, even within Bud Apex mix, 
uh, as that mix shifts, it should drive very, very healthy margin expansion on top of that faster growth. Yum China, we've highlighted in the past, this is the master franchisee for KFC and Pizza Hut in China. It's one of the best managed restaurant companies globally with top decile unit economics. And we think it can double its unit count this decade at very high returns on capital. Its results were severely depressed over the last three years, but it actually flexed its net cash balance sheet to accelerate unit growth over those two to three years while competing operators were actually retrenching. So we think earnings power has grown materially beneath the surface, which will show up over the next 12 months. Finally, Richemont owns what we think are the two best brands in luxury jewelry, specifically Cartier and Boncleef. Something like 40% of its business comes from Asia, which is more than its listed peers. These are iconic, irreplaceable brands and should see outsized benefit from the return of Chinese shoppers, both in China and in its tourist destinations like Europe, Japan, and Singapore. We're already seeing that start and we expect it to continue. Again, these are all well-managed, high return, competitively advantaged businesses that we thought would emerge stronger coming out of COVID than they went into it. We took advantage of depressed valuations over the last two and a half years to buy them. And we're highlighting them now because we're excited about the tailwinds they're going to experience over the next 12 to 24 months. And we think our patience is now being rewarded. So Michael, back to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Michael. Um, Pivoting to international equities, uh, can you update us on this situation in Europe in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Uh, is the worst behind us now? Um, you know, we know European equities are historically cheap, but where do you see opportunity now? Sure. So regarding Europe, Europe was clearly the most adversely impacted by Russia's invasion, uh, you know, given their huge reliance on Russian energy and natural gas. Um, you know, and, and in the last year, European markets, you know, discounted, were discounting at a minimum a, a consumption recession uh, and a much deeper recession than elsewhere in, on, in the world, given the, this, this huge anticipated increase in fuel, electricity, heating costs. Uh, really, they were probably the epicenter of the kind of uh, inflation problem squeezing out uh, economic activity and consumption. So uh, inventories were being hoarded, but now as we've approached the winter season, you know, temperatures are well below normal and it appears that conditions will be better than what was feared. And so, um, you know, I guess looking back in the last year, the crisis really did begin to move EU countries closer together. So in the big picture and for, for this, and for the intermediate and longer term, Europe has definitely taken a step towards greater fiscal union and mutualization, which we, you know, we're really excited about. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, all in the, the post-crisis aftermath is, is driving a recovery in the Euro and a probably much lower long-term risk of a breakup. Uh, and so we do see, you know, we're at the early stages of, of we think a recovery and an expansion, earnings expansion in, 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 in the Euro area. Um, more specifically, or in thematic terms, you know, we see Europe's necessity to move away from reliance on Russian energy and, and broader commodities as a major investment opportunity with its really global implications. That phenomenon is, is really un underlies our global security and supports our sustainability themes. Um, and so I would just say in the big picture, again, we've said this many times, you know, in this, uh, we've entered this new era where geopolitical priorities are superseding economic and financial optimization. You know, whether you're talking about globalization becoming deglobalization, this global capital investment cycle we're talking about, diversification of supply chains, you know, this is all part of this new era, which we think is going to manifest, you know, in, in, in new leadership within the markets. Uh, Europe will be one of the beneficiaries coming from, you know, I would say very tempered expectations at, at you know, looking at how, how it's valued today. I think this is probably a, a good spot for Ching is maybe to chime in, you know, on these themes and specific names here. Uh, but I really think, um, you know, the, the, Europe is the epicenter of this global capital investment cycle we talk about. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I want to highlight one of the European stocks that we continue to be excited about, which is uh, Meyer Burger Technology, which uh, forms part of our sustainability theme. Almost a year ago, we talked about them as one of the main beneficiaries as Europe plan to deploy renewables as part of their energy security agenda to accelerate transition away from Russian natural gas. So Meyer Burger is a Swiss-based supplier of solar modules and its next generation heterojunction solar modules are more efficient, 
they produce 10 to 20% more energy per area than traditional PERC modules produced in China. So as a result, they command even more premium prices because of balance of system costs exceeding uh, module costs. And as a result, this stronger pricing power, which you don't find that often um, in, in renewables, they can generate higher margins than competition. Meyer Burger has strong modern momentum for these products already with demand exceeding near-term supply and is currently ramping the capacity in the US and Germany. In our view, the company is a long-term beneficiary of greater localization of energy supply chains. This is the global CapEx investment cycle Michael talked about and uh, reduced reliance on China, which currently produces roughly 80% of global solar modules. Last year has been one of the top contributors for the Barron International Growth Fund, but we're still bullish on the name. And there are a number of catalysts that have emerged since our initiation uh, that have further enhanced our thesis, leading to even greater upside to uh, our growth estimates. So first of all, in August of last year, the US Congress, US Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act that provides companies with attractive incentives, tax credits to bring manufacturing of solar modules and cells back to the United States. Same months, uh, several days apart, Meyer Berger announced plans to significantly expand or triple manufacturing capacity in the US, supported by long-term offtake agreements with um, key customers. Now, Europe is preparing a response to the US IRA with the EU Commission, EU Commission putting forward the Net Zero Industry Act which is designed to protect EU leadership in renewables and boost growth and capex of targeted industries. We believe solar capex, capex incentives will likely exceed those in the US because EU domestic solar companies have particularly suffered over the past decade from Chinese competition. So there's some estimates that new solar installation in Europe could triple over the next decade to more than 100 gigawatts annually. And in Germany, that's where the other half of Meyer Burger's capacity is, we could see acceleration of cap capacity expansions, which we believe is currently not in the street numbers. So even on consensus numbers, the shares currently trade at six times 2025 EV EBITDA um, after the already announced and funded three gigawatt of capacity comes online in 2024. And this multiple is less than half of the multiple where more established Chinese producers trade at, which we believe will lose share. We believe there's an upside to those sales numbers, particularly in Europe. And we think Meyer Berger's technological competitive advantage will enable them to continue to gain market share both in North America and Europe. Thank you. And I'll pass it uh, back to Michael. Great. Thanks, uh, Roger. You got Great. it. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Chingis. Um, now moving along to the rest of the team and the portfolios, um, can you kind of, uh, Anuj, take, take us from here uh, through the rest of the team? Can Yeah, I, I think Jose, uh, Jose will start. Uh, All right. The rest of the team. Jose is All right. Away. Yep, thank you. Let me jump in here. Thanks, Anuj. I'm Jose Barria. I cover international financials here at Barron. And I wanted to talk about a phenomenon that is happening worldwide in my sector and which uh, we're very excited about. So we're witnessing a major shift in monetary policy across the globe as a consequence of the inflationary pressures from COVID and the war in Ukraine. And that has major implications for the sector. Uh, we believe the most positive impacts of this change will be felt in banks in the developed world in places like Europe and Japan, where central banks have been among the most dovish and where banks have had to contend with negative interest rates for many years. To take advantage of that shift, we increased our exposure to European banks in our international growth portfolio during the second half of last year via a new position in Bank of Ireland, uh, which is one of Ireland's largest commercial banks. We have been bullish on European financials as we believe the region will see greater fiscal inter integration and risk sharing among economies, a theme that we called EU mutualization, which Michael alluded to in his earlier comments. But we believe that theme is largely, you know, as we believe that theme is largely playing out, um, there is even a bigger impact that is coming from what's happening on the mon monetary policy side, which would have uh, greater implications on earnings for financial companies. Uh, and that is why we've increased exposure to the space. Uh, during the second half of 2022, the ECB started raising interest rates, hiking the policy rate up by 250 basis points in the span of about five months. So now any short-term liquidity that banks have deposited at the central bank is going to start earning a positive yield, 
versus being a cost in the last three years. And any assets that are linked to benchmark rates will start to reprice upward, upwards. The, the revenue uplift that accrues to the banks from that is massive. And that is especially true for banks that have more repricing power over their liabilities, which is what really brought us to Bank of Ireland. Uh, in that market over the last year, the sector has gone through major consolidation. And now three of the largest banks control roughly 75% uh, of the system deposits. Banks in that market are also among the most liquid in the region with loan to deposit ratios of 60 to 80% versus 90 to 100% for other European peers. That means that more repricing power, um, sorry, that means that they will have more pricing power and less of a need to compete for deposits to fund their road. In addition, their asset base is mostly on variable rates. So they will be quicker to reflect the ongoing repricing of policy rates. And because of this, we believe that Bank of Ireland will see wider margin expansion and revenue growth compared to other European peers. Another reason we like Bank of Ireland is due to the solid balance sheet and ability to return capital to shareholders. In the last 15 years, since the 2008 financial crisis, European banks have been deleveraging and building capital ratios to meet increasing stringent regulation. And in the last two years, largely due to the economic uncertainties of COVID, Bank of Ireland has tightened, under, tightened underwriting standards and built large excess reserves. To, that, to us, that means that the balance sheet is now stronger and of higher quality, which will allow them to better withstand any potential macro slowdown. The Irish economy is also expected to be one of the most resilient in Europe, given it has zero dependence on Russian gas, the government is running a budget surplus, and the unemployment rate is close to 20, uh, is close to 20 year lows. So we believe these conditions will allow Irish banks and especially Bank of Ireland to keep credit costs lower than the regional peers. You know, if we look at the last reported quarter, Bank of Ireland had a core equity tier one ratio of about 16%, which is among the highest in the industry. And it also has been one of the most proactive in building extra reserves during the COVID times. And we believe this gives them additional buffers to deal with any potential losses and will help them keep credit costs low as we go forward. So to summarize, we see major earnings tailwinds for developed market financials due to the change in monetary policy globally. We believe the combination of higher revenues from rising interest rates and benign credit costs will drive about 20% earnings CAGR over the next three years for Bank of Ireland and propel its ROE from about 7% in 2022 to about 11% in 2025. While the stock is already up about 40% since we initiated the position, we believe we can still generate close to, or at least over 15% annual return on this name over the next few years, which makes it a very attractive investment opportunity in our view. So I'll stop here and uh, maybe pass it over to Eitan to talk about his sector. Uh, thanks, Jose. I'm Eitan Chemerinsky covering international tech. As part of our China digitization theme, I'd like to highlight our investment in Glodon, a leading Chinese construction software provider. We believe that Glodon is uniquely positioned to benefit from increasing software penetration in the construction industry, which is the least digitized in China. China's construction IT spending is only one-tenth as much as the US as a percentage of construction output. However, this gap is set to narrow significantly over the next decade as Chinese construction companies accelerate IT investments to boost productivity amidst rising labor costs. Chinese construction companies traditionally use pen and paper or Excel spreadsheets to estimate the required materials and cost of a construction project. Glodon software provides a much more automated and accurate alternative, including a real-time database with updated materials prices. Glodon is the dominant player in China's cost estimation software market with 70% market share. As a de facto industry standard with a very sticky user base, the company enjoys a wide competitive moat. Furthermore, over the last few years, Glodon has undergone a successful transition to a subscription cloud-based model, leading to increased earnings visibility, while maintaining best-in-class gross margin of over 90%. Glodon is leveraging its leading position in cost estimation software to expand into other construction IT verticals, including building information modeling, digital design, and enterprise resource planning. These products are at an early growth stage in China with still limited penetration. We expect Glodon to ultimately emerge as the leading player, offering a one-stop shop integrated solution across the entire smart construction ecosystem. Finally, we believe Glodon can maintain strong double-digit earning growth, even amidst the slowdown in China's residential real estate market, as overall construction activity, including commercial buildings, industrial plants, hospitals, and infrastructure remains robust. And with that, I'll pass it back to Roger. Terrific. Well, thank you, uh, Eitan. Thank you, Jose, Chingis, Eric, uh, Anuj, and Michael. 
Um, we appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you all for dialing into today's call. And uh, we thank you for your um, interest and uh, investments at Barron Capital. This concludes today's call. Thank you.